Okay, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna start by passing it off to Abby Bell, uh, Savannah Vice President, and we'll get started with our data privacy webinar. Hi guys, good morning and thank you for joining us afternoon maybe for some of you. Um, just wanted to start off with a, a quick intro. Um, I'm a vice president at Symantle, and some of the teams that I work with are the marketing automation team, so email marketing, SMS marketing, um, our developers, our media team, and also our research and insights team. Um, so I'm happy to be here and, and join Travis as he teaches us all a little bit more about uh, data privacy. So Travis, uh, if you want to do your intro, and then we'll jump right in. Sure. Thanks, Abby. My name is Travis McGlass, and I'm an executive technology director here at Symantle, also data protection officer. Uh, my background is predominantly in the kind of media analytics digital strategy space, and most recently uh, related to data privacy here at Symantle. And we're going to walk through a variety of topics today related to data privacy, um, both in terms of kind of the, the legal environment that we're operating in, as well as how these things can translate into um, the marketing we do on behalf of our clients and, and for their customers. So. But before we get started, I want to go ahead and uh, just put up a disclaimer real quick. So because we're talking about some topics that cross over in the legal space, please know that uh, any conversations we have about recommendations or things we've done either for our agency or on behalf of our clients um, should be taken with a grain of salt and always consult with your own legal counsel before actually acting on any of these recommendations. So. So topics we're going to discuss today are we're going to take a few minutes here to define data privacy, um, talk about the landscape around data privacy and how that's changing uh, with, sorry, with different laws are going in place as well as some of the marketing technologies that are changing around this, uh, how you can use those marketing technologies to build consumer trust while protecting their, their data, and then finally walk through some of those ideas and examples that we find to be kind of best in class for what's out there in terms of how to uh, take the minimum amount of data and turn it into great customer experiences. So again, just to reiterate, we're, we are marketers primarily, not lawyers. So uh, please seek your legal counsel and advice for anything before implementing it. Uh, the lens that we're going to use today for looking at data privacy is primarily through the lens of a marketer uh, and the work we do on behalf of not only our agency, but our clients. We're gonna talk about some of the learnings we've had as our agency has progressed through this data privacy journey here over the last two to three years and discuss some of the trends and challenges we see in the data privacy space that'll be developing over the next one to two years. Hey, Travis, before you go on, I just wanted to make sure everybody can see the slides. Awesome, thank you. All right. So some questions you might be asking as you're on this data privacy journey. First, what should I be doing right now to make sure I'm compliant with data privacy rules? Also, what can I be, do, be doing to be more proactive in this space? Obviously, with this environment changing both from a technical standpoint and a legal standpoint, it's incumbent upon us as data privacy professionals as well as marketers to make sure that we're always trying to stay one step ahead of what's going on and at least be prepared to make those changes when they come about. Uh, I've put a lot of time in my data privacy governance. How do I communicate that to my audience to build trust? So moving kind of beyond privacy policies and those kind of statements, how can we really you know, make sure that the consumer and customers know that we're gonna do right by them from a data privacy standpoint, we're taking the minimal amount of data required in order to be able to provide them the best customer experience and that we're limiting uh, and fully transparent with the data collection methods, methods that we're actually employing. And the last one, when a user selects dismiss on my website uh, for like cookie consents, for instance, what are my options now? What can still be tracked? How can I make sense of that data after the fact from an analytics standpoint and some of the challenges that are associated with that? So we're gonna take some time later on to go through all those questions in a little bit more detail. So sit back, relax, and we'll go ahead and jump into some background information on data privacy. And we're gonna begin by taking a poll. Bear with me here for one second. OK, 
Okay, and the first poll is just to kind of level set and understand uh, what the environment is everyone's operating in and kind of understand where you're at in your data privacy journey. And we'll give everyone about 10 more seconds or so to answer. So if you haven't answered yet, please go ahead and do so. Okay, poll is now closed. Uh, so about half of our attendees have actually got a data privacy program in place and are using it regularly. Uh, about a third uh, have a data privacy policy in place, but um, haven't fully figured out how to leverage that within the organization. And the remaining 20% are kind of in that, that mode of unsure or uh, don't have a data privacy policy in place at all. It's good feedback. We'll try to take that in context as we talk through the next few topics. So let's take a few minutes and walk through some kind of foundational definitions related to data privacy. Um, there are three kind of key terms that we'll use sparingly throughout the webinar, but you'll run into a lot if you're looking at any of the laws and regulations that are in place, or if you're engaging in any kind of research related to data privacy in general. Um, the first of those terms is data subject. And we've got both a technical definition as well as a simplified version we'll show here in a second. Um, but I'll pause for just a moment and allow you to kind of read the technical definition here. Uh, the important point of the important thing to point out in this technical definition is that uh, when we're talking about a data subject, we're really talking about the ability to identify a specific individual. So when we say things like, um, you know, first name, ID number, um, you know, exact physical location, um, those kind of things, those are the things that kind of constitute uh, being a data subject. But if we kind of use the the less technical sub definition really anybody we're collecting information on. So any kind of natural person that we may be collecting data on um, and may have in our database, uh, you could loosely define as a data subject. The next one, controller. Um, a controller, again, the technical definition here is in front of you. Um, in the marketing space, you know, a controller in a lot of, in, in a lot of instances, um, at least for us as a marketing agency, it's usually our clients, uh, or it could be a third party data provider who we're you know, contracting data from. A controller is generally defined as an organization that really kind of determines the, the why and the how the data is gonna be processed and, and ultimately has kind of final decision-making authority over that. And the simplified version of this is, you know, basically the person who owns the data. It isn't always the same thing as the person who collects the data, um, but the person who gets to kind of make the you know the decisions around how it's used uh, how it's applied and usually has legal responsibility for any kind of ramifications that come up from improper use or breach of the data and the last one uh, that we want to mention is being a processor or subprocessor of the data uh, as a marketing agency this is the space we primarily find ourselves in while we do have uh, we do operate as a controller for data related to our clients and those we're marketing to on behalf of the agency. In most cases, when we're doing client work, we operate in this processor slash subprocessor environment, which means that we often take direction from a controller, uh, often one of our clients, in order to determine how best to employ this data. Um, that could be you know, in the space of marketing automation, uh, like Abby's team that could be, you know, manipulating uh, information about data subjects to send out email marketing campaigns. It could be doing analysis um, to understand the impact we're having from an ROI standpoint or any kind of variation of those, of those techniques. All right, so now we're, th we're through some of those definitions. Let's talk about data privacy today and really get to the heart of, you know, why it is we're even discussing this subject. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with at least the acronym GDPR. If you're in the marketing space, it's a topic that's been a fairly heavy discussion for the last several years. Now, GDPR uh, stands for General Data Protection Regulation. It is a law of the European Union, took effect on May 25th, 2018, and is really focused on companies that operate in the EU and are marketing to EU citizens. 
Um, the reason why we talk about GDPR even here in the United States is because the GDPR is kind of the, one of the first large um, instances of a government passing regulation related data privacy that actually had teeth and had enforceability. Uh, and so already so far, hundreds of millions of dollars in fines have been levied against organizations, primarily companies um, that have been accused of violating the tenets of GDPR. And so this is uh, different than, than a lot of the laws that have been passed here in the U.S. or elsewhere, where we've had regulations in place that have kind of governed the use of data and tried to provide some minimal protections, but haven't really gone so far as to actually put in force um, enough, uh, enough enforcement to actually make companies react to it and change their policies and act in a different way. And these fines that we're seeing come out of the EU related to GDPR are really starting to have that effect. Um, it's also the case, too, that a lot of the big data providers um, in the marketing space, the MarTech space, like Google, Facebook, have heavy presences in the EU. And so this has driven um, somewhat of a change in terms of the way they do business that has even had some downstream effects here in the U.S. So there are several reasons why GDPR are important, um, especially if you're an international company. You need to take some consideration if you're operating uh, in that jurisdiction. But even here for companies that are operating just in the U.S., there are downstream implications of GDPR that it's good to know kind of what's in that document and how it kind of lays the foundation for data privacy in a lot of instances. Now, in the U.S., a lot of us have had to look at the um, issue of CCPA. So CCPA is the California Consumer Privacy Act. This took effect. Um, it initially was going to take effect in January, January 1st, 2020. There were a few delays on some of the restrictions related to this that actually went in effect, uh, I believe, on July 1st. And there's still some exclusions in place for B2B companies um, that are running, I think, to the end of the year. Now, CCPA um, is much like GDPR. It's focused on companies that do business within California, within California residents. Um, and so, you know, if you're operating across state boundaries in the U.S., this is a regulation that you will um, likely have to consider. Um, but also, similar to GDPR, this is one of the first kind of real um, uh, focus, enforcement focus regulations that came into play in the U.S. And California, as you're probably aware, is the headquarter for a lot of the big kind of MarTech and ad tech companies, including, again, Google, Facebook, uh, companies like Salesforce and others who often compile and use a lot of uh, customer data. And so because of that, because they operate in those states and because just by virtue of their location, they are marketing in a lot of cases to California residents. Again, CCPA has driven a, a change in the way of doing business for a lot of these companies uh, that they hadn't otherwise or wouldn't have otherwise considered doing, primarily because the restrictions at the U.S. level here um, are not quite as, uh, in, quite as enforceable or don't have quite the same weight as CCPA and GDPR do. So let's pause for a moment. We talked about GDPR and CCPA. Those are kind of the two big acronyms, at least in terms of the legal landscape for GDPR, or I'm sorry, for data privacy. But there are a couple of other things worth considering. So there are some what I would, would deem to be like legacy laws and industry specific laws that are in place. Uh, one of those is CAN SPAM. CAN SPAM is a, is a regulation that is specific to the US. Uh, CAN SPAM was created in uh, 2003 really focused on two different aspects of the digital landscape. Um, the first one, uh, which in most cases isn't, isn't relevant to marketers, was to kind of limit exposure uh, of children to pornographic material. Um, didn't really govern a whole lot of, you know, didn't really affect a whole lot from a marketing standpoint, but the other half of the law that does is around email opt-in and making sure that companies are allowing people to opt out of marketing communications. So you often see can spam referenced um, with regards to email marketing, making sure that your email marketing has the opportunity for people to you know, leave your track via opt out uh, and, and making sure that you are being compliant and not kind of overselling or over committing in your subject lines and other descriptions in your emails. That's really derived from that can spam law, which hasn't changed all, much since that 2003 introduction. Um, other industry laws that you may be familiar with, HIPAA is one that most people are familiar with because because we all um, you know, patronize um, healthcare establishments. We probably run into HIPAA, had to sign HIPAA releases. Uh, FERPA is one that's in place for individuals who are working in education or higher education, which governs uh, how you can release uh, information related to students, student records, student marketing. And there are also a variety of other laws governing 
uh, disclosure of information related to uh, you know, financial reports for individuals and all kinds of stuff. So depending on what industry you're in, you really do wanna sit down with your legal counsel and data privacy experts and figure out if there are applicable laws beyond things like GDPR and CCPA that are relevant to your industry. Uh, there probably are some that are out there if you're in a heavy, heavily regulated space. So take time to uh, sort through that, figure that out. So that you know that whenever you implement a data privacy policy, you're keeping in mind some of those edge case laws that might affect your industry directly, but don't affect the broader data privacy environment. Now, there are also some uh, state and kind of location-based laws here in the US. Uh, I'd say the majority of US states have laws governing data privacy to some extent. Um, almost none of them have as much kind of enforceability or have the same kind of consequences as CCPA. Um, they primarily focus on things like uh, disclosure of uh, data breaches. So in the event that you have uh, information about data subjects that is released inadvertently, either through a hack or uh, inadvertent distribution, um, you know, those, there are laws that are in place that kind of govern the timelines in which you have to react and communicate to legal authorities and to the affected data subjects that you want to take in consideration. So make sure that you're also mindful of those um, requirements for those are also included in laws like CP, CCPA and GDPR as well. Under the topic of future regulations, um, you know, this is kind of just for a moment here, stepping out of the space of talking about what's currently in place and speculating on what might come down the pipe here in the near future. But with CCP, CCPA coming on board, with a variety of states also looking at the opportunity for implementing their own data privacy laws, you know, it wouldn't be too far-fetched in the near future to see something come out uh, within the U.S. that might be more akin to like a GDPR that would kind of govern data privacy uh, from a federal standpoint and cover more jurisdictions than just individual states. Uh, one of the challenges that, you know, data, data providers, um, data warehousing companies are going to have is that if we begin to see this kind of patchwork of you know, 50 or depending on how many territories we have, 50 plus, uh, you know, different laws come into play is it'll be, become very complicated for marketers uh, and data providers to operate in that environment. So it wouldn't be um, too much of a stretch to see us potentially, you know, lobbying for uh, a broader federal law around the topic of data privacy in the not too distant future. We're gonna go ahead and pause one more time and take uh, a new poll. And this poll is focusing on kind of what your biggest data privacy challenges are currently. Um, we're gonna pause for about 30 seconds or so. So go ahead and take a moment here and uh, record your answer to this question. And we'll get back here in about uh, 15 more seconds. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and wrap that poll up. If you haven't voted yet, enter your response quickly. Okay, and our results are as follows. So a uh, little less than half of the individuals who answered that poll have said so one of their challenges is, is that it's really hard to relay the uh, importance of data privacy within their organization, it's certainly something that can relate to, I mean, it is a space that, um, you know, often can kind of come across as compliance um, or kind of, you know, going through the kind of legal minutia. And I don't think that's in the intent of most privacy professionals. Certainly there's some risk associated with the data, data privacy space, but in the end, most people that I've talked to, either on the client side uh, or other consultants are certainly the mindset that we hope that data privacy becomes a, a tool and a platform that can help, you know, facilitate better customer experiences. Um, a couple of folks, uh, about a third, have said that they don't know how to audit their data um, to determine what their risks are. Uh, even for an agency, you know, of, of our size, we were challenged with that initially, and there's definitely some opportunities I think we can talk through uh, later on. Some process you can put in place, depending upon what, what de depending upon what your infrastructure looks like, that can help facilitate how to audit that data. Uh, and then about a remaining third of the individuals who are on the poll indicated that um, their impact is a has in, their approach has impacted their ability to market effectively, and they're also unsure where to begin developing a data privacy process. So again, hopefully some of the examples that we're gonna go through over the next um, remaining portion of this webinar is gonna help to address those concerns. And as always, we're more than happy to follow up with anybody after the fact. 
that may have more direct questions about their specific situation or their marketing efforts and how we can help you to uh, facilitate that. So, so let's go ahead and start to jump into some of those things. So we're gonna keep on the topic of, you know, some of the tenants of data privacy that we need to focus on related to the legal environment. Um, but also we do feel pretty strongly that a lot of these, you know, tenants of data privacy and rights of data subjects do ultimately in the end create an environment that is uh, providing a better customer experience. So uh, and we'll, we'll address that here even in the first few bullet points. So the first three here really focus on transparency into the data you have. Um, and they include things like right to access. So data subjects, um, you know, have the right or the ability to be able to see what information you have about them uh, and very much related to that. And specifically to GDPR is that uh, that particular piece of legislation uh, requires the ability of a data subject to be able to rectify or fix that data. And certainly I think we can all relate to the fact that, you know, in an instance where we might collect data from an individual via a form or we make some, might make some assumptions about, um, you know, a data subject by virtue of their previous uh, marketing behavior, we might make a mistake in that process. And certainly it's in our best interest as marketers and data privacy professionals, as well as that data subjects to allow the opportunity for that individual to correct that record and, and hopefully improve their experience by getting the right information to them uh, about their specific, uh, their specific need or wants. Finally, the right to know how you're gonna use that data and to whom you might share it with in order to process it. Um, you know, that's a, another good tenant of transparency into, into data and really making sure that people don't end up receiving information or receiving marketing communications from organizations or about things that they may not want to, right? So if I know that I'm gonna receive a whole bunch of follow-up communications from a whole bunch of additional partners um, or brands that I maybe have no interest in, uh, that's gonna provide a bad customer experience for me and probably not something I'm gonna be interested in doing. And it may actually harm my perception of that initial company or brand that I'm engaging with. So it's good to know both on the part of the data subject, but also for the company itself. The next tenets of data privacy are focusing on the right to object, transfer, or remove. So building off of that last bullet point in the previous slide, uh, the right to object, and, and this is specific to, to GDPR, um, but also just a good general data privacy consideration, um, is giving your data subjects the right to object to processing, either completely in the sense that um, I you know, would, would ask that you not process my data in any way whatsoever, um, or in part. So as you can see here in this kind of blowout example here on the right, this is an example of, of an opportunity here to have kind of limited data processing uh, in a web environment. So you can see this is a um, part of a cookie consent process here um, that we've outlined. Um, there are a variety of companies that provide these kinds of services, but what this cookie consent process does is it allows you to opt out in part of some of your processing. So if I want to provide my information for the purposes of analytics, uh, I can still do that. If I want to provide it for the purposes of being communicated with after the fact to get relevant information regarding the content that I've consumed or what that brand may deem to be my relevant interests, I have the ability to do that as well. And then I can kind of confirm those here and come back and change those. So that would, that would be an example of how you might be able to pro be able to allow somebody to opt out uh, in part. Um, and also specific to GDPR, the right to opt out of automated decision, decision making, which is that you know if I want to avoid having uh, you know dynamic content that's served up you know via machine learning or an algorithm of some sort, you can opt out of that kind of uh, that kind of communication. The next bullet here is the right to opt out of data sales. Now this one is uh, unique to CCPA. Um, you can, you know, in a roundabout way, opt out of data sales in GDPR just by opting out of the ability to get your data processed or to have your data removed. But CCPA specifically reserves the right of a data subject to have their information opted out of sales uh, data sales. So if you're a company that aggregates and then resells, and that's part of your, you know, your privacy policy that you've uh, laid out in front of a data subject, um, you need to reserve the right of that data subject to opt out of that information or opt out of that distribution. So you can still collect their information, you can use it for your own purposes, but they need to be able to have the right to be able to say, you know, it stops here, it doesn't go beyond to another third party that may use it for a different purpose. The next bullet is the right to transfer data to another controller. Um, so this, again, similar to the previous one, um, 
you know, the second bullet point is focused on data sales. So there's some kind of transaction there. Um, this third bullet point is kind of just general exchange of information. So the right to provide it to another party who can then use it for their own purposes. Uh, another good tenant of data privacy is to kind of limit that. Um, and the final one here is the right to remove your data or be forgotten. Um, so they're all, those are all good um, tenants of data privacy. The last one here, again, you know, in GDPR specifically, that's really what allows folks to opt out of data sales, um, since that's not specifically cited into, into GDPR at this point. Now, having said all those tenants of data privacy, there are a couple of exceptions that's probably worth noting here, um, just so you're aware. Um, most of the regulations in place around this do have some degree of limitation. Um, and those limitations include if you have a kind of established, established business relationship. So this is an existing client and some of that information that you have stored about them uh, is required in order to conduct the day-to-day -day, um, operations of your business and communicate with them as a customer. Um, that certainly uh, you know, allows you to retain a certain amount of information and not have to delete everything. Uh, again, with all of these things, you want to make sure that the degree to which you can retain information based on these limitations is reviewed by your legal counsel and is specific to your uh, your industry and your company. Um, secondly, uh, employment. So, um, you know, a data subject can be an employee or an applicant for a position. And so for those reasons, employment is also potentially a limitation depending upon what you're collecting. And then certainly um, the next two are, are probably speaking for themselves, but um, all these regulations usually reserve some leniency towards um, either the company itself being involved in a legal investigation or the data subject in question that's part of that data set being involved in the legal investigation. Um, and then finally, na issues of national security. So, so we're going to go ahead and take our third poll now before we jump into some more specific uh, examples. And go ahead and take a few seconds here and please pause to go ahead and answer this poll related to subscription management. And we'll be back with you here in just a second. Awesome. So I will go ahead and jump in with some of our, our poll results here while we let Travis uh, catch his breath. That was a lot of information. Um, subscription management, uh, we put this poll in because a lot of times that's kind of the gateway for marketers to start learning about data privacy and regulation. And it's the first time that they start hearing um, about some of these laws. It looks like uh, about half of you guys say, yep, our subscription management is, is totally compliant. We're in a good place. 33% uh, or so say um, we're taking subscription preferences, but they're kept in various places right now. Um, and then the remainder there are saying, yep, it, it's probably time for an overhaul, um, which again is really good information for us as we go through the next couple of slides. Um, so this is the part of the webinar where we start looking at a couple of ideas and examples. Um, please know that this is not a complete list by any means. Um, and I'll reiterate the fact that we are not lawyers. We don't even play them on TV. Um, we're marketers and are trying to navigate all of the legal information um, as best we can, both for our agency and our clients. So with that, uh, let's jump into cookies. Um, cookies are always um, a, a good subject to start on um, because it, it impacts what we can do today as marketers. So the first thing I wanna answer is, what is a cookie anyway? Um, so a cookie is, is simply a, a piece of data uh, that a website, for example, places on your computer or your mobile device to store information um, for you that will make navigating their website easier. Um, so think about when you do your shopping, whether that's you know maybe Target Online or Amazon, uh, any of those um, online experiences that are so familiar to all of us. When you put something in your cart, and then you go to look at something else, continue shopping button, right? That item stays in your cart throughout your experience. And that's one example of how a cookie can be used, right? To make that process um, kind of seamless and easy for you. 
when we start looking at cookies, there's a couple of different types. And based on the type, um, there are different um, regulations and accessibility to those cookies. A first party cookie is something, um, a cookie that is created directly by the site that you're visiting. So if you go to Symantle.com uh, and Symantle drops a cookie, that's a first party cookie. Um, currently it's it's allowed by default um, in browsers. Uh, many companies doing the right thing are asking users to accept cookies. We have a couple of those examples on screen here. Um, then there are third party cookies. Um, if you are, again, going to Symantle.com, um, there may be a, a Sharp Spring cookie or an Eloqua cookie or a Facebook uh, pixel, um, all of those things that we use to try and make your experience there um, easy and relevant for you. Um, so third party cookies are created by a domain that is not the site that you're visiting. Um, Today, many browsers are blocking that by default. So if you're using Firefox and you say, yep, when you download it, just set it up standard. However, Firefox comes, that's what I want. Um, those third party cookies are going to be blocked by default. Um, that's becoming more and more uh, the standard. And so as marketers, that's super important for us to understand because a lot of that impacts how we do our marketing. So looking at um, why do we need cookies, right? Um, Abby, that's great, but but why do I care? Um, lots of lots of reasons. Um, cookies help us track the behavior so we can provide better content, right? So um, if we know that you have a specific um, interest in a product um, or a service line, we can feed content to you that's relevant. Um, Cookies also help us to track conversions. So as marketers, we can see which campaigns are working and which need optimization. Um, they also help us to store some user preferences, right? So that we start to know you. Um, if you've ever been to like a Disney site, they're, they're really great about um, getting to you and Abby, here's what your family should be doing today, right? And all of that is, is cookie based so that I feel like, yes, they know me, they remember me from the last time I was on the site. Um, and those are all things that we use as marketers to create a great customer experience and help that user along their journey to becoming a brand advocate for us, right? So that's why cookies are so important in the conversation seems to come back to them pretty frequently. Um, so on the next slide, I'm gonna ask Travis to come back in and talk to us about tracking prevention. Travis? All right, thanks, Abby. Um, so as Abby mentioned, you know, one of the challenges that we're seeing in this space, especially related to, related to third-party cookies, is uh, them being blocked. And, and the, the protocol through which most of those third-party cookies are being blocked is something called Intelligent Tracking Prevention, or ITP. Uh, Apple, uh, which obviously is, you know, has created all of the different Apple devices, but also has written uh, the Safari web browser, is one of the larger proponents of ITP. Uh, Mozilla, which creates Firefox, uh, is also a big backer of ITP. Uh, and even over the course of the last several months, uh, Google, which is in charge of the world's probably most popular web browser, Chrome, has said that they're going to start to follow ITP um, best practices here within the next about 18 months, which means that third party cookies will be all but blocked in most cases moving forward. So we're going to walk through a scenario here that kind of identifies how this works and what the impact is, especially for, for advertisers and anybody who is using like a DMP type product. So if you have an ITP enabled web browser, which again right now by default that includes Safari and Firefox and will in the near future also affect uh, Chrome. Um, what this means is that when your browser connects to a web server, so let's say I'm going, in, going to CNN.com uh, to view some news related content, um, that browser is not gonna be able to identify through a cookie, who I am and what some of my previous behavior is, uh, which creates a challenge when CNN then connects to an ad server to determine, hey, how can I generate revenue off this user and serve them an ad from one of the brands or agencies that I work with? Um, and so again, not having that cookie in place, having that block by default means that no data about me 
uh, specific to my myself as a des data subject in my previous web history transfers from that website to the ad server, which means that ad server then has you know very limited or no data to provide back to the brand or advertisers database to determine whether or not per that person should be targeted by a marketing campaign. So when we look at characteristics we've used in the past to identify you know whether or not we should place an ad in front of somebody, like their previous web browsing history, um, um, their previous use uh, or maybe our use of first party data from our website to determine who this person is from a retargeting standpoint even, uh, all of those things are then blocked by ITP, which then results in our inability to target this person specifically back through that value chain, back through the ad server, uh, back to the web server, and then put an ad in front of their face. And that obviously creates a lot of challenges because so much of what we've done in the ad tech and martech space in the last few years has re relied on DMP or data management platform type technologies in order to find those users with a combination of third party data that we may purchase and, and pay for on top of additional CPM or even taking our first party data uh, and information we know about this individual based on their engagement with our own marketing materials, whether that be email or our website and then trying to find those per, those individuals through a third party cookie on a, another website, again, like CNN or any other publisher based site out there. So you know, ITP is one of those things that um, because the majority of folks are still using you know, Chrome and other folks might be a little bit behind on updating web browsers, hasn't fully kind of hit a lot of advertisers and brands yet, but is going to in the very near future, especially now that Google announced that they're gonna move beyond um, move beyond their current protocols and adopt full ITP here in the next roughly 18 months. So companies that are in this space that are trying to address this issue are working around the idea of trying to provide some kind of identity resolution platforms. Uh, and those platforms rely on a combination of data that exists kind of in the greater MarTech ecosystem from uh, data providers, but also kind of blends in your own first party data to assign a, a unique identifier that's not cookie based. Um, and you know we'll see how successful those platforms are in the near future. Um, Apple's got a history of trying to you know, exert greater and greater control over people's ability to advertise um, to their users. And, and that may you know, affect whether or not these alternatives to third-party cookies will be successful. Um, but there are a variety of companies as well as organizations like the, um, like the Interactive Advertising Bureau or IAB who are also trying to address this and make sure that as we move forward, we can we can still leverage highly targeted advertising in a way that's respectful of people's uh, data privacy and user preferences. So for those of you that answered the poll, I have a hard time explaining why data privacy matters to stakeholders. This is absolutely where this comes in, right? Um, so far in the user experience, the only thing that's happened is I've opened my browser, right? And already third-party cookies are blocked and um, your ability to serve intelligent ads is affected. So let's say that I'm for now on Chrome or I haven't updated my browser. Um, the second piece of this is based on the user, right? So let's say I, I get to yoursite.com. Um, and the first thing that you pop up being a good steward of data privacy is you pop up a um, question that says, hey, we use cookies. Would you like to accept this? Um, if I say, no, I don't think so. Um, and I click on no, then not only is your um, ad strategy affected like Travis was talking about, but now even your first party data is affected, right? You can't log anything about that user even in your own data warehouse. And so again, I think everybody is, is kind of on the boat now that marketing requires data. And this is why data privacy matters is because as we're allowing people to have more and more privacy over their own data, it is going to impact the way that we market to all of these folks, basically anybody that's on the internet. Right, so, and Abby, we, I know we've talked about yeah. before too, that you know, depending upon where you service customers from a geographic standpoint, right, you may be required to uh, provide this kind of environment where you allow people to opt out if you're in a situation where you might be covered by GDPR. 
uh, for companies that aren't, you would definitely want to have a consideration around whether or not this approach is right for you because um, you know it does significantly impact your, your first party data collection. Right, exactly. And so the next question is, well, do I need to worry about cookies? And and this is kind of where Travis was coming in. If, if you're a, a global international company and you operate or, or market or sell to um, someone that is covered by GDPR, there's very specific guidelines around what cookies are necessary, um, when someone does consent, how long does that apply for, um, and, those things need to be taken into consideration, right? Um, because if if that data isn't being tracked appropriately and stored appropriately, then you can't use it to determine whether or not you can even market to that person, right? So so let's say you're Abby. I I don't like I'm not international. I'm I'm just a small you know company in the U.S. Okay, well, if you actively sell to California residents or operate within that state, CCPA, which Travis went over, also has guidelines on how those cookies need to be disclosed to the user, right? So if someone does click on the yes, somewhere on your website, there needs to be some documentation around, hey, when you say yes to cookies, these are all the different things that we're tracking and, and why we're tracking them, right? So that user is informed. Um, the, the last question on here is um, if you are actively managing cookies on your site, um, you, you also write, obviously that's gonna be a big consideration on, on if you need to worry about them, but this isn't a one and done thing that you can do, right? Um, those uh, cookies need to be audited um, on a regular basis to make sure that the website is only using tracking scripts um, that you're actively using for marketing campaigns. Um, so if two years ago you dropped um, some script on your site for a campaign that you were running and you're no longer using that, the audit is going to show, hey, we probably don't need to be tracking this particular thing on users because we're not using it anymore. And, and that's just over consuming people's private data. So short story is we all need to worry about cookies and be informed about them um, and be able to talk to the data privacy professionals that we work with as marketers um, to explain why we need cer certain tracking and, and be able to let go of things that maybe we're not using anymore. For those of you that do have, um, which should be almost everybody now, has the, the pop-up of, um, you know, can, can, will you accept cookies? Um, you have likely seen people say no. Um, and so the number of people that you can track with cookies is likely declining. And so one of the things that we wanted to bring to the forefront is what happens when I don't have those cookies? Is there a way to do cookie-less marketing? And so we have, um, again, a finite list of some of the things that we've been doing and, and that we've been working through with some of our clients. Um, so the first one here is contextual marketing, kind of going back to the basics, right? A little old school um, for those higher funnel awareness type campaigns. Um, Google AdSense was the first to kind of do this broadly. Uh, Contextual marketing basically looks at a website, figures out what the keywords are there, and delivers ads that are related to those keywords. Um, so sometimes going back to the basics can be beneficial. Um, the next thing on here is SMS campaigns. Uh, it's, it's great for combining um, offline and online behavior um, through everybody is um, carrying their cell phone around right constantly. Um, so it's a great way for people to to have an immediate conversion, even when they're not um, in front of their computers, they're on their mobile, at a store, at a trade show. Um, and, and that's a great um, quick conversion there. Um, the great thing is that with most um, marketing automation platforms now, um, Salesforce, Eloqua, et cetera, these SMS campaigns can be automated and triggered. So it, it will definitely continue to evolve. Um, SMS comes with its own opt-in requirements um, and time to set up, but definitely worth looking into. The next thing is um, apps as a channel. 
right? We've seen this um, in a lot of regions, um, out more so outside the US um, with WhatsApp and WeChat and being able to meet your prospects and customers where they are. And if they're not in email and they're um, more so in an app, feeding them the content that they need and want there um, and, and kind of going out to them. Um, the next thing is uh, look-alike modeling. So um, we do this um, with a lot of our clients looking at what is your, your perfect audience, right? Who are the people that are really engaging and converting and now let's go find more of them. Um, we do that a lot with social media channels and that's something that you can still do um, without those cookies if you're doing it through those social media channels. Um, the next thing is to buy ads directly on sites where your audience is, right? Again, kind of old school, um, but if you know that um, your crocheting club right goes to crochet.com then hey let's 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 get some ads there about the next meeting etc kind of a silly example but i thought we could use one of those at that point um ip targeting um not new uh, i think that uh, a lot of people are using it in account-based marketing, right? So if you know that you're going after a specific account, um, targeting those IP addresses where you know um, the, the actual um, location of those uh, top 10, these are the accounts we wish we had, um, and, and feeding ads that way versus doing a cookie. Um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a wide net, but in a specific location. Um, the last one that we have on here is location targeting. Um, so this is, uh, to me, one of the, the coolest because I've actually, you know, seen it happen and maybe you have too. Um, when you're driving by, you know, driving down the freeway and you get um, a push notification from one of your retail apps that says, hey, if you're near the store, we have a special. Um, those things like location targeting where you're actually um, offline out in the real world uh, can be combined with an SMS campaign, right? Um, or um, app as a channel. So I really like the ability to do that and combine it with some of these other functionalities um, to, to give the user a omni or multi-channel experience, right? So that you can um, reach them in ways that they have a good experience. So data, right, the new currency, we've talked a little bit about how marketing campaigns all need data. That's where we start, that's kind of where we live. Um, and I like thinking of data as a currency because it, it kind of makes a quid pro quo, right? The more data you ask for, the more you need to offer in response whether that's um, how many fields you have on a form, or if you're asking for an app download, um, just remember that um, these, these people, they're, they're all actually human beings, right? And they're giving you this private information, so they definitely expect something back. So it's always good to kind of take a step back and say, is this equal, would I do this in, in my own life? Would I give this much information to get this return? Um, so one of the things that we couldn't end without talking about, um, and I'll go through it quickly, is subscription preferences, right? So when we're talking about um, the form strategy on your website, for example, um, and you get to the bottom of the form and there's that hopefully unchecked box that says, yes, I'd like to opt in to communications, um, opens a world of, of different preferences that your users should be able to select, right? Um, we always want to be honest, telling people why we want their data, how we're going to use it. Um, we want to have a system where that data comes in, um, definitely timestamped and logged so that you can go back to an individual and say, on this date at this time via our website, you explicitly opted in to receive our communications. Um, and we want to make it easy, right? We, we want for the users to have a quote unquote global subscription when they opt in. Like, yes, Samantha, you can send me emails. Um, but when 
if and when they get to a point where they say, oh, I don't, I don't think I want emails anymore, and they go to that unsubscribe page, um, which here's a, a B2C example for Yankee Candle, which, which is super simple and easy um, to look at and, and get through. Um, we want that experience to be easy. Um, am, I, am I telling you that we want it to be easy to, to lose that ability to market to that person? No, not at all. But even if someone's unsubscribing, we want them to have a good experience with your brand, right? So the Yankee Candle I love because um, the email address is filled in, right? Automatically when you click that unsubscribe button, um, you can hit one button to unsubscribe or you can hit a snooze button that says, I just don't want emails right now, but you can email me after 30 days. So there's a lot of different options that you can um, kind of incorporate there. The last statement I'll say about it is just make it easy and have it be plain language so that the customer um, or prospect understand what's going on when they click a button. So around um, some of those uh, cookie list marketing ways and subscription preferences, you have people coming into your database. Um, if and when you start seeing um, people emotionally unsubscribe, as I like to call it, like they're just not opening your emails. Um, they're still technically subscribed. Um, this is the point where if you use Gmail and mobile, Gmail will come up and ask you, hey, are you still reading emails from um, your site.com? Because uh, it, it doesn't look like you're reading them. So if you wanna unsubscribe, click here, right? So we want to beat Gmail to the punch um, and trigger some engagement programs that again, very plainly just say, hey, it's been a while since you read our stuff. Do you still wanna continue getting it? Um, a lot of times we recommend using um, some sexier content um, like video or, or something fun, something that's really um, on point with your brand so that when they see that, they have that good, feeling again associated with your brand and they may still unsubscribe and that's okay because now you have several other channels where you can reach them um, if you're using that that list of cookie list marketing tactics so um, just one more example of how you can make um, all of these compliance pieces a really good customer journey um, remember that if someone dismisses cookies or says no or unsubscribes from email or says stopped to your SMS messages, it doesn't mean that you, you can't make that person a great brand advocate, right? This is kind of where knowing your customers and what they like and what channels they like um, really comes into play because they may be the biggest brand advocate in the world, but they prefer to go in and talk to someone and, and do their business offline. And sometimes as digital marketers, that's kind of hard for us to understand. Um, but as long as you make all of those processes um, easy and enjoyable and, and delightful, you can still wrap a great customer experience around all of these data privacy requirements. So we'll have one last poll um, and then wrap up. Um, so tell us a little bit about um, what you learned today hopefully at least one thing um, that might impact your marketing. Uh, we'll give you guys a couple of seconds to vote and then Travis will give us the results and close us out. All right, thanks Abby. We'll give everyone just a few more seconds here to go ahead and respond to the poll before we close it out. So if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and log your uh, entry now. And we'll go ahead and close things out here and take a look at some of the results. Uh, so one of the things, it seems like the, the majority of folks said they can explore more cookie list marketing activity. Um, that's definitely uh, the um, largest category of responses we've got, followed by um, people challenged by the inability to track behavior and it's impacting uh, things like being able to report on ROI, followed by, uh, I need to figure out our cookie policy. Uh, which can certainly be a challenge, especially across multiple websites and multiple MarTech and AdTech platforms. 
Um, all right, so let's go ahead and close things out. We just have a, uh, another minute or two. Uh, and this really is just kind of walk through a roadmap to success for implementing a data privacy program. This is roughly the process we followed internally here at Symantle um, that's been able to help us kind of establish our offering and figure out how we can better serve clients. Um, and this really starts with an audit, right? And an audit here, it, it's really pretty broad. It's gonna encompass things like um, who within your organization uh, utilizes uh, protected data, um, where does that data exist on different platforms, um, you know, who do you have or who do you leverage, maybe from a third-party standpoint as a processor or a sub-processor data to get that work done or to connect to your clients. Um, a wide variety of things really encompasses internal policies, procedures, your kind of IT environment and whatnot. Um, so that's really the first step is to kind of do that overall uh, assessment of your landscape, followed by if you don't already have a good information security policy in place, making sure that is adequate. And we make a delineation between information security and data privacy for an important reason, because there are some applications of information security, like level of encryption, limited access, and all of those things that um, are very much related to data privacy and can help you avoid having things like breaches and making sure that data is not laying out where it shouldn't, but really kind of fall in that kind of core IT or infosec space. Um, and aren't directly related to how an individual's data is uh, removed or forgotten or how we give somebody the ability to come back in and kind of rectify their information or those kind of things. So it's very important, we think, at least to have a delineation between those two tasks, especially in large organizations, because those two things can often be two different departments, divisions, groups. Um, so making sure that that both those groups of stakeholders know that they have an important role to play in this space is, is important. Uh, the next one is kind of creating your kind of data privacy document or plan. So this is going to lay out, uh, you know, things that that might have come up during an audit, and exactly how to address those deficiencies or shortcomings, and also lay out a, a plan and guideline for how we're going to do the next few things, which is provide ongoing training to employees, which would include identifying groups of individuals who are kind of most at risk uh, for the organization uh, to provide data privacy challenges. So let's address those folks first and kind of work backwards from a prioritization standpoint, and also make sure that we address other kind of general IT security related issues, you know, things like phishing and spear phishing and whaling, even in employee training to mitigate things like data breaches. And the final step here, and, and probably one of the most important steps is just to keep doing this, right? Because the environment we've talked about, um, the things that Abby and I have been, have been talking about for the last hour or so are constantly changing, whether that's the legal environment, uh, and different governments and, and jurisdictions that are constantly updating, changing, implementing laws. Um, the expectation of our customers from a customer experience standpoint in terms of how they want to engage with us and what data they want to provide and how we are the best, how we can be the best stewards of their information, provide them the experience they want, not necessarily just the experience we want to provide them. Uh, and then also making sure that we're staying up to speed on what's changing in the, the technology space to continue to provide that experience. So, you know, things like ITP, cookie, bro uh, cookie blocking, and all those other challenges are things that you have to keep an eye on. And those are gonna impact changes that will happen uh, within your information security policy, within your overall approach to data privacy. There are things that, uh, you know, especially when you're an agency like us, that your employees need to be mindful of and need to be able to communicate to their clients about and implement strategies to work around or um, to address. And so knowing that this is an iterative, iterative process and this happens, um, you know, it starts today and it, it doesn't end, it keeps kind of refreshing and recycling over time is really, really important. Um, you know, data privacy is not something we do for, for six months and then we put this on a shelf um, and then walk away from it. Uh, because if we do that, you know, on, after, you know, those six months, month seven, eight, nine, the entire environment's already changed and now we're having to kind of go back and restart all over again. And we've lost several months of time uh, where we could have been learning about the environment, how it's evolving, addressing our uh, concerns proactively. So when we were looking at, you know, early on the presentation, how do you stay proactive? It's really through following this kind of methodology and kind of recycling this over a period of time to make sure that the approaches you're taking uh, are keeping an eye on what's happening in the future and serve both uh, as an agency, our clients, but also our clients, customers from a customer experience standpoint as best we can uh, in, in current time. So with that, uh, we do have a wide variety of content out on our website. Um, some of it touches on this topic. We've got a couple of blog posts related to data privacy and what it means for marketers, 
uh, an article on GDPR around the time that came out recently, or it came, that came out not too long ago. Uh, we've also got a podcast recently that Missy did uh, with um, with an organization that really stays on the kind of you know the front end, the trends related to uh, data privacy. And they mentioned briefly things like identity resolution in that podcast that'd be good to listen to. So um, all these pieces of content are available on our website um, or in the podcast situation, they're available on marketingsweats.com. So I'd encourage you to take a look at those and subscribe to our newsletter uh, if you want to stay up to date on the most recent content related to these topics. And finally, uh, you know, if there are any questions you might have that were spurred from this conversation on data privacy, anything you want to dig into deeper, uh, Abby and I would love to hear from you. Um, you can contact us directly via our email on the screen in front of you, or you can contact Symantle uh, as an agency at Let's Connect at Symantle.com. So um, we do have, uh, we're right up against the hour. If anybody has had a couple questions, we'd be happy to stick around and answer the questions. But I want to thank everyone for joining the webinar today and uh, learning a little more about data privacy. And we hope to provide more opportunities to dive deeper into this topic and go into some more practical, practical examples about how to better serve your customers and clients in this space in the not too distant future. So with that, I'll kind of open it up and see if we have any questions.